Good afternoon, uh, Teresa. Thank you for coming to talk to us uh, today. Um, I would like to start by asking you a few questions about the history of Eskel. Uh, as we know, Eskel was started in 1978. From the very start, the company had an international outlook. So, for example, I know that the company started exporting to the US uh, garments at a time when uh, China had only just opened up to the world. That was 45 years ago. Uh, how would you say the situation has evolved over the years up until the recent past, especially in terms of uh, the within Asia, the production and also the consumption uh, within Asia? So I think um, um, in 1978, situations were very different. Um, I think my father, who's really a true entrepreneur, has seen that uh, opportunity of um, really the Western world, especially US and uh, Europe market, was the major markets for um, us as a manufacturer. Um, so during those years, the focus was really on how to set up our supply chain in order to be able to support the growth um, of exporting to these key markets. And I think if you look back, it was definitely a right decision because the situation was quite different from today. Whereas today, I think um, in the news, everybody was already talking about the split in the um, global supply chain. And we obviously situated in Asia, we also see that um, whether it's due to you know, this whole split or really uh, more fundamentally is the um, different dual um, political issues, uh, we should uh, focus more on the Asian market because it's closer um, to our manufacturing base. At the same time, I think Asia has a lot more growth potential in the you know, near future. And therefore, I think for us um, who actually understands you know, the, the fundamentals of how to do the right, um, set up the right supply chain, uh, needs to learn how to surf a very different market. Although, you know, people are saying, oh, but you're still manufacturing, you know, similar products. True, I think product-wise could be similar, but the way to operate and surf, um, whether it's uh, the greater China market or the rest of Asia, is a new um, knowledge that we should all learn and gain from. Yeah, I think part of it is the fact that Asia as a region has become more prosperous over the last 45 years and therefore uh, you know the need for uh, you know being self-sufficient we see it in many different countries there are measures taken to achieve this so at the same time there has emerged this idea of uh, Asian century leadership mm -hmm to address this emergence of uh, you know, the more prosperous classes within Asia. Do, do you think uh, Asian century leadership is different or needs uh, additional qualities that a traditional, more Western-oriented mindset uh, requires? Um, I think today now, is the, the beauty is a lot of Asians are also very well exposed to the Western world. So, however, in Asia, we still have a very strong Asian culture. Um, I think the culture part is really very rich and it's something that we should treasure, especially you know, for Eskel, we are family business. So we have a very strong um, corporate um, culture where our values are really very much aligned also with our family values and that evolve gradually. Um, that because of you know, um, our commitment to sustainability. So um, I think all this is important. But at the same time, because we are very well exposed to the Western world, so we are also learning from them in how to uh, make good use of systems and um, you know, uh, technology in helping us 
to shape um, our sort of uh, supply chain as well as the, the, the whole business concepts to become more sustainable. Mm. Yeah, so this concept of sustainable development in business, uh, when we talk about ESG concerns, for example, I happen to know that uh, Escal uh, promotes this idea of the e-culture and the five E's, you know, which represent the value system that the company operates by. And it seems to me the company was well ahead of the curve in many ways, because my understanding is these value systems they are not new. They, they've been around, you know, in, in the company. It's been passed down generations. So, you know, in terms of thinking about uh, the integration of ESG principles in businesses at large, how easy or how difficult do you think it is to, to, to achieve this? Um, for us now, it sounds like e-culture is something that we all embrace and sounds like, oh, okay, you ask all the SCAL people, you know, they can also tell you about um, how they are using each E in their daily lives. However, at the beginning, it was very challenging. Uh, when we first um, introduced this e-culture in, I think, around year 2000, um, that was a time when we felt that we were, we were still at the, you know, rapid growth rate. At that stage, um, we were operating in many different countries, countries where um, they speak different languages, um, the different uh, religions, um, of course, also different culture. And for us to sort of like bring them all into the same family, we need something that everyone can understand that those are the focus and priorities. And that's why we introduced this 5E culture. And the first E that we emphasized was ethics. And that also shows that uh, we are very much a people-centric um, company, which means that we really treasure you know, people as our most important asset. And without that, we don't think we can have a group like SCAL. And so right now, after you know, over 20 something years, um, I am quite confident to say that majority of our people, except that maybe a new joiners, and I think COVID was another challenge where we cannot go and visit our people um, on a regular basis. And so, but then after COVID, this whole one year has been an important year for us to regain the ground and make sure that everyone is still very firm on the commitment and the understanding of the importance of the e-culture. And so now I think when we look back, we're very lucky that we have built that foundation because otherwise during the three years of COVID, especially when SCAL was facing a major challenge um, of a really get stuck with a, you know, uh, this geopolitical issue about uh, with Xinjiang. Um, I don't think we were able to really get people to align and understand why we need to transform at such a rapid pace. So we we're glad that we actually introduced that uh, in around the year 2000. And now I think what we need to do is continue to make sure that everyone see the importance of this e-culture and with the new divisions that we are building, we have to make sure that they also embrace that. So you, you mentioned one of the E's ethics and the focus on people. Another one of the E's is education. And I happen to know, you know, uh, you have a lot of accomplishments in business already, but you are also very active in community building, especially in promoting educational opportunities uh, for children and education in general. Uh, would you share your motivations for engaging in such uh, community work? How does that, uh, you know, align with uh, you know, what you're looking for in terms of business objectives? Um, again, because we are a family business, private company, so we do have uh, some room for us to uh, decide what is really important, especially on the longer term. So as I said, uh, people is 
critical for us. But at the same time, when we look at um, you know uh, people, uh, one of the I would say mission for SCAL is to really um, address the wealth gap issue. Um, so we are in many um, uh, I would say developing economy, and so we have seen a lot of situations where uh, in the past. Um, people do work for us because they need uh, a job. Uh, but I think, especially for today in China, you can see that educational level has gone up and people now can have a better standard of living. Um, so we really um, treasure that as an important part. That's why we also want to invest in education and also for the local community because this is a win-win situation for us as we see that people, the local community um, they can also have a better educated workforce then a lot of the new technology that we now develop uh, we can use it so we don't have to continue moving or relocating like in the past from a uh, in the past like we have uh, factories in Hong Kong, but it was just too expensive because the labor force is very, very limited. And so we cannot afford it, so we have to move it to another overseas countries. But we don't like to continue on this path. So right now in China, this is a good demonstration of if you invest into educating the local community, then they will be the right people that you can continue to use in your own facilities by investing into more, say, automated or more digital tools to help them. So it, I think that's a win-win situation for us. And at the same time, we feel that it's our obligation to support the local community because we are also making money from that location. So I think that also is part of our e-culture. So anyway, I think all this proves that um, it helps the local community to really um, bring their standard of living up and as well as helping you know companies to have a better performance more efficient operation yeah so talking about the evolving business landscape we discussed earlier in terms of 1978 compared to today things are quite different uh, and then thinking about the role of education in uh, you know, addressing you know, human development. Let's try to think about the two together, all right? So uh, what do you think uh, the role is of business schools in terms of preparing the future generations of business leaders? Are business schools part of it or you know, do people learn best on the job? What's your view on this? I think uh, business school is going to become more important if more companies are prepared to transform and go on a much more sustainable business model because um, we need the, a place like a business school to you know, send out the right messages to the um, business leaders or upcoming business leaders especially uh, to get more exposure because business school is really a great place for um, not only to teach them knowledge, but for you know, the students to get network with the industries, to get exposures. And also, um, I think young people has a lot more energy. And transformation requires a lot of very positive energy. So we need those young business leaders or to be leaders um, to have that commitment and the belief that this is the right way. And so I think uh, that's why it's important that business schools is the bridge. Yeah, especially I think for um, students who have gained a bit of work experience to go and uh, do a program like uh, what CU um, is offering right now, um, because then they can also see the challenges when they are actually in their you know, job, facing all the different pressure or the need to transform.
Yeah. Well, I'm very glad uh, to hear your view on this, uh, that uh, business schools have an important role to play. And uh, on that note, I will thank you for uh, taking the time uh, to share your perspectives with our listeners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.